Ladies and gentlemen, I think you're about to experience something very special. I've already seen a brief preview and I can promise you, you're going to see some interesting photos. I'm very happy to present to you Quinn Norton on Body Hacking. So um, this, is, uh, this is the first time I've given this talk publicly, actually. I've done two of these talks before, but they've been in completely private, non-spoken of venues. So this is going to be kind of new for this to actually be something that people are seeing in the wider public. Um, so uh, I uh, originally this started in um, 2005. I started getting interested in specifically not just modifica body modification, but functional body modification, this idea of body modification that does something. Um, and uh, you are the platform was actually the name of one of the articles I wrote about it, and that's been one of my favorite phrases since then. Um, I'm a journalist. Uh, that's basically my main foray into this. I come actually from a, a, a body modification family. You know, it's, a lot of people talk about this being a rebellion thing for most people, but for me, I was like sitting in the waiting room of the gauntlet while my mom was getting pierced. So for me, it was always perfectly normal. Um, and, uh, and so I'm just kind of going to another level, next generation of it. Uh, my name is Quinn Norton. Um, and I'll have contact details at the end. Uh, one of the reasons I didn't want to start this talk too early is because um, there is a lot of things that kind of go to certain people's edges and boundaries in this, and I respect different people's boundaries, and I don't want people to walk into this room and not know what they're getting. Um, I, I have no body shyness, and I will be discussing bodies without euphemisms <laughs> or anything like that. Um, there is blood in this presentation. There's less blood than the first cut of this presentation, as, as it were. <laughs> um, there are things in here that hurt a lot. There are Frank's dis discussions of sex. Um, I, I put in possibly not safe for Germany. Um, <laughs> because <laughs> um, it, I actually am not sure about the laws. And one of the one of the main people that I've worked with during this whole process is Shannon Lorette of BME. And I don't know how many of you know about BME, but BME is actually banned in Germany. Um, which uh, I had a moment, I don't know if it was actually an error or something with Swisscom or something with BME at the time, but I like, was trying to pull up some last minute pictures and I was like, oh, that's right. <laughs> um, um, also, uh, it, this talk, last time I gave it, I just kind of rolled on, and then I got to the end of the talk, and I realized like everyone in the room was going, <laughs> except for one guy in the middle who was just going. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> so having had that experience, I, I can say it might get creepy for you. <laughs> um, but I wanted to make sure everybody kind of had that caveat up front. Um, and it's not like any of us are going to, well, f for me anyway, I'm not going to, be upset with anyone if they don't want to see any of this. Um, so I, I kind of I used to kind of embed my philosophy in, um, in the talk at this point, or when I was talking about it, now I'm just going to be really upfront about it. I'm pretty much pro all of this stuff, which you know, isn't a huge leap, but um, I was kind of looking at how it relates to hacking especially, and um, this is the statement I came up with, is body hacking is like all other forms of hack hacking, ultimately a form of volition, the freedom to enact your will upon a system. In this case, the system is your own body, and um, I, I, th um, I think that there's a, there's a little bit of a um, digression to take here, actually, before I go on to my body hacking motto, which is that right now, we kind of wrestle around how ethical or legal or taboo hacking is on computers. But when you start talking about hacking your own body, even though it's your own body, you're passing a lot more taboos. Um, and, and frankly, a lot more laws in many cases. We actually have less rights in most societies to our own body than we do even the diminishing rights to our own computers. Um, and when you start to kind of think about the fact that you don't have those rights to your bodies, it can be very, you know, you kind of, people think in terms of abortion or something like that, but you don't have the right to most surgeries that has to be determined by an accredited state function, basically. Um, now, I don't know that that should change immediately because I think there's a triage issue. I think that we don't have enough medicine for everybody to get everything they want. You know, it's probably good that we treat sick people first. 
but I think there's an, I don't see any ethical reason why you shouldn't be able to get what you want. Um, so, um, I, I don't know if any of you are familiar with Make Magazine. I don't know if you are. Uh, um, so, Make Magazine is, a, is um, something I occasionally write for. Um, uh, that is a, a hardware hacking um, magazine in the U.S. Um, and it's been very fun, fairly new, lots of good hardware hacking projects in it. And um, they're kind of, they have this whole like, void your warranty with us kind of thing going on. And they have a motto, which I decided was my favorite for body hacking, and it's this. If you can't open it, you don't own it. <laughs> now, there's two things to remember here. One is opening it is painful. <laughs> Trust me. <laughs> and the other was actually like the contrapost to this was actually something that came out of a science fiction convention I was at a few months ago. I was looking at a first time science fiction writer who had never been to conventions, and I don't know if you know much about science fiction writing over here versus convention culture and fandom over here, but they aren't necessarily as related as you might think. And uh, this first time writer showed up his first, time, first conference and he, said, and he was relating this to me and he said in one of the most trembling, terrifying voices I've ever heard. Nobody told me about the furries. <laughs> so, when we think about total volition on our bodies, I want you to just realize that this would entail, you have to understand, this would entail a certain class of people running around with ears and tails and fur trying to have sex with other people. With ears and tails and fur. And you know, I don't know if that's the world we want to live in. I'm just kind of putting that out there. <laughs> um, so, how we currently think of body modification. Usually, body modification is transgressive, it's visual, um, this is a scarification in progress, this is someone who is really into it. Um, one of the reasons I like to have this one out is because in, this, in one picture right here, you have a whole bunch of different, it just looks like a bunch of bumps on his face, but you have surface piercings, which are actually quite hard to keep. Um, you have uh, you have tr tr uh, transdermals, you have implants, that's what the horns are. You have um, a completely kind of, the, a lot of the piercings we're used to. And then we, you have like that funky cheek thing, <laughs> which I've seen almost nowhere else. And then over here you have the kind of like common 22 year old transgressive, I've got a tongue piercing thing. <laughs> um, uh, now, when I started talking to Shannon Lorette of BME um, about functional body modification, one of the first points he brought up, and I dodged like a ninja, was um, that genital piercing is a functional body modification. Most people, not all, but most people who get genital piercing or have genital piercing have it to enhance their sex life, and many of them report that it does. Um, and he kept pointing out, that's functional. And I kept going, that's not going to go in my Make Magazine article. <laughs> Can we stop talking about that? <laughs> um, but frankly, he's right. Um, and it's kind of on the edge of the scope of what I want to deal with, but this is why people get genital, modifi um, genital modification currently, whether it's beating, I don't know if you know what that is or want to, but um, whether it's beating or piercing or something like that. Many people would report that while the upfront pain can be quite intense once it heals, it's an enhancer for them. Um, now, interestingly, that would probably be the oldest form of modification for enhancement. So in a historical context, it occupies a very important space. It is the first time that we have changed ourselves to change our sensory experience of the world um, uh, through what you think of as body modification. So I really quickly, outside of the scope of this talk, and not necessarily not functional body modification. That's one of the reasons why I'm kind of putting this up there, because I think there are a lot of people who know something about this that could argue with me very effectively that many of these, these things are functional body modification. I just don't feel like doing it. Um, ritual, most much modification gets involved with ritual. Uh, the current sexual modification I was just talking about, emotional and transcendent experience, suspension, these sorts of things. I mean, you go up on meat hooks for, an hour, you're going to have a modifying experience <laughs> and, you know, probably come down functionally different. <laughs> and, um, um, and, and the last two are kind of grouped and, and there's a small digression I want to make about cutting and what I call fun with pee, um, which is that there is a really uh, important function to, uh, the pee is the, res is, the, is the receptor involved with pain. Um, and uh, Basically what happens is something stimulates that, whether it's eating a red pepper, punching a needle through yourself, falling over a stair, being bit, bitten by a dog. Um, something stimulates that, 
That sends a signal, it releases endorphins, the endorphins release is a certain amount of dopamine, uh, and you actually get kind of a, you get kind of a I can cope with it signal. Now, the, the interesting thing is that I can cope with it signal that goes all the way from your, your hands or your legs or wherever you got hurt to your brain is a generalized I can cope with it signal. That means that for a lot of people, if they're in emotional distress, which isn't releasing any endorphins, and they put themselves in physical pain, they get an I can cope with it signal. That's a pretty functional thing for a lot of people to do. Um, now, that gets into cutting, um, which, is a, which is almost a universally abhorred act in which people who are very unhappy slice themselves open, look at blood, that sort of thing. And, um, and I think there's a definite range of how unhealthy that can be. There's definitely applications of binding to pee and cutting that are fairly healthy and ones that are acknowledged by society as healthy. It's okay if you're depressed to go exercise. It's doing the same thing as cutting, but we're okay with the exercise part. Um, right now, we're not so okay with the cutting part on a societal level. So that's pretty much all I'm going to say about that. But it gets involved with a lot of these things, a lot of things people want to do. And, you know, I once very anonymously had a, a therapist who had been working in the field for many, many years say to me, drugs are so hit and miss, if people can cut, healthfully, I'd rather they did that than take drugs. Which is a surprising statement for a medical professional. But it acknowledged that often people go through hell trying to find an antidepressant that works for them. Um, and some people can just do it with a Japanese clothespins. So anyway, um, probably the thing that you guys are here to hear about <laughs> is the magnet. <laughs> so this is kind of going into specifically what people are doing now. This is kind of this part of the talk. And what people are doing now, this is one of them. Hopefully they're not doing it right now for reasons I will, um, I will make clear in a moment. But this is the implanted magnet. The implanted magnet um, is, goes in um, the uh, tip of the ring finger, one of the most nerve-rich areas of the body. It doesn't work unless it's one of the most nerve-rich areas of the body. It's a small, rare earth magnet. It's coated in gold and then a bio-neutral plastic sheath. Um, it's, it's put between the subcutaneous and the fascia of the skin. It's just nestled in with the nerves. One suture and you're done. Um, and yes, you can hold up magnets with it. <laughs> um, the results of this. Um, so. A lot of people, when I say, yes, I have a magnet in my finger, say, is that like a psychic or arthritis thing? <laughs> and I'm like, no. <laughs> um, the idea is that the magnet moves in the response to electromagnetic fields. Um, and that means that I can sense them. They feel, well, used to be able to sense them. <laughs> I, they, they would feel like a slight oscillation, almost a vibration in my finger. Um, and it wasn't immediate. It took time both to heal and to sink in. Now, one of the interesting things that um, all body hacking is to some degree about is neuroplasticity. If we have any edge over the rest of the animal kingdom, it is probably not that our brains are so big, but that our brains are really good at reconfiguring themselves on the fly. And essentially, what you're taking advantage of, if you did something like implant a magnet in your finger, is the fact that your brain can reconfigure itself on the fly to take in that new sensory data and treat it like a sixth sense specifically for detecting electromagnetic fields. I had six senses. Well, seven if you include proprioception, which I would like to. <laughs> um, so what can people with magnets in their finger sense? Um, uh, small running electrical motors, uh, live wires, security devices, like when you walk into shops, you know the security devices that you walk by? Shannon Lorette at one point reported walking through one of those and feeling like he dipped his hand in an ultrasonic cleaner. They had it turned up so high. Um, uh, uh, phone cords. Phone cords startled the hell out of me. My husband can verify occasionally. I'd be like going, yeah! <laughs> um, and um, and uh, swap. That's, this is one of the really, really interesting ones, is that when my laptop, and uh, several people reported this, when my laptop started to swap, I could feel it because when the hard drive spun up. <laughs> and so it was a, there was that like, kind of just split second before it slows down when you're like, oh. <laughs> 